Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mark Cantor. As president of the Jewish Heritage Center of Western Canada, I would like to welcome all of you to our program this afternoon, a conversation with poet Ruth Panofsky, reimagining Adele Wiseman. I would like to acknowledge that the Jewish Heritage Center of Western Canada is located on asset ancestral lands on Treaty 1 territory. The Red River Valley is also the birthplace of the Métis. We acknowledge the water in the museum is sourced from Shoal Lake 40 First Nation. The vision of the Jewish Heritage Center of Western Canada is to forge a pathway for the future by preserving and sharing compelling stories and educating the present and future generations. The program this, uh, this afternoon is a wonderful example of this vision. I'm now going to introduce to you Daniel Stone. Daniel is Professor Emeritus of History at the University of Winnipeg, where he taught East European and Holocaust history. He is past president of the Jewish Heritage Center of Western Canada and is presently the chair of our programs committee. Dan? You just have to unmute yourself, Dan. Sorry for the delay. Thank you, Mark. And it's a pleasure to, to bring this program to you. I'm very much looking forward to it. Before I introduce the, the substantive part of the program, I'd like to set a few housekeeping matters. First, would, would everyone, except for the people speaking, keep their mics muted so there's no background noise and, or no other interference? Secondly, there'll be several times that you can pose questions or they, that questions can be answered. So please feel free to pose your questions at any time, write them in the chat line. For those of you who aren't familiar with the chat line in Zoom, uh, if you put your cursor down, usually at the bottom of the screen, there'll be a whole set of little <clears throat> icons that appear and one of them will say chat. Sometimes on other computers or iPhones or various other phones, it, it's located someplace else. And then if you click on chat, you'll have an opportunity to write your question. There'll be two or three times in the middle where, uh, where the the, uh, where Ruth and Neil will deal with the questions, and then, of course, at the end. The program format is that, as indicated, Professor Neil Besner is the moderator, and he will direct the, gem the substantive part of the program in conversation with our main speaker, Professor Ruth Panofsky. Briefly about, uh, about my old friend and colleague, Neil Besner, born in Montreal, raised mostly in Brazil, came back to North America, to the US, and then to Canada, where he got his BA at McGill, master's at the University of Virginia, doctorate at UBC, taught as one does as an assistant along the way, and then at UBC and Mount Royal, before he joined the English department of the University of Winnipeg in 1987, where he taught English literature, especially Canadian literature, has extensive publication record, especially dealing with Canadian literature. Uh, short stories and short story authors are his specialty, Mavis Gallant, Carol Shields, Alice Munro, and also as well poetry and a subfield perhaps is from the literature of his second country, Brazil. Been very active on the local scene with, with writers. But Neil, in addition to the teaching and uh, research has done a great deal in, in uh, administration. He was chair of the English department for, for a while and then first dean of arts. He had held several different vice presidentships uh, at retirement just a couple of years ago. He was vice president academic and provost to the University of Winnipeg. Among his contributions that reached beyond the university itself is his guiding and implementation of the indigenous studies requirement for undergraduates at the university. In so-called retirement, 
Hill has moved to Toronto, where he does some teaching at Ryerson, a lot of consulting on university affairs with other universities. And uh, he's involved in a number of writing projects, some of them of a personal nature. Neil, thank you very much for coming and joining us. It's good to see you again, and please take it away. Uh, Dan, uh, thank you very much. I don't recognize the person that you just introduced, but that was very generous of you. Thank you. Dan and I have known each other for over 30 years, so it's wonderful to, uh, to see him again. So uh, my role is just simply to moderate, as Dan said, and I am delighted to be able to introduce Ruth Panofsky to you. I've known Ruth for a goodly number of years as well. So uh, I'm not going to take too much time because to talk about Ruth's accomplishments would take us a long time indeed. So let me just tell you very quickly, uh, Dr. Ruth Panofsky is a professor of English at Ryerson University. She specializes in Canadian literature and culture. Her scholarship focuses on Canadian publishing history, on authorship studies, on textual scholarship, and particularly on Jewish Canadian women writers, as we will see in a second. So for many years, she's been a highly active and award-winning scholar and writer. Uh, and as well, she's been an award-winning poet. And this current volume, uh, which we're gonna hear about in a second, Radiant Shards, is her third book of poems. Her scholarship is focused on writers like Margaret Lawrence, Miriam, Miriam Waddington, and on the inspiration for this current book of poems, writer Adele Wiseman. Dr. Panofsky has been writing productively about Adele Wiseman for going on 30 years, beginning in 1992 with an annotated bibliography of Wiseman's work, followed by a 2001 edited collection of essays on Wiseman, and one culmination of that work came in 2006 with with uh, Dr. Panofsky's major scholarly work, The Force of Vocation, The Literary Career of Adele Wiseman. Her most recent publication launched uh, here in Toronto virtually on Zoom a few weeks ago uh, is the new edition of the new Spice Box, Contemporary Jewish Writing, wonderful collection, which I'm looking uh, forward to uh, hearing more about. So I'm gonna have a brief con conversation with uh, Ruth and she's gonna tell us a little bit about uh, how she came to write Radiant Shards, the poems in Radiant Shards, and then she's going to read a selection. As Dan said to you, there are gonna be opportunities for the audience to ask questions. We'll pause uh, mid-program or a couple of times to read the questions and Ruth will answer them. But I'd like to just start the program and ask Ruth if she would briefly describe to us, uh, Ruth, how did you come to write these poems. I, I know that they're inspired by Crackpot, by, by a character in Crackpot in Wiseman's second novel, but tell us, tell us how, how you came to write these poems in, in Hoda's voice. Thanks, Neil. Thanks so much. I think you've already answered that in a way in terms of the introduction, yeah. that lovely introduction you gave in that. Uh, Adele Wiseman and her work has been kind of in my head for years and years and years. I've been working on Wiseman um, as a scholar and um, reading her work and teaching her work. Um, but the one character who left an impression and never left my head was Hoda. When I first um, read Crackbot many years ago, I was stunned by the character stunned by the achievement of that novel. And um, Huda really stayed with me forever. And um, at some point, I'm not quite sure when, the uh, idea of writing a book of poems in Huda's first person voice uh, came to life. Um, one of the things that struck me about Wiseman's novel is that we do come to know Huda intimately through the first third person narrator, but um, it's still a, a character that's filtered through this narrator. And um, for me, I just felt like I, I needed to inhabit the character and I felt like I kind of owed it to her given that um, I felt so uh, close to her in so many ways. So hence this book of poems that really imagines the interior life for Wiseman's character, um, draws on the novel, obviously, but I've tried to enter into the character and create her for myself, really. I think of her as my Huda, 
she doesn't ever trans, uh, transplant uh, Wiseman's Hoda, but she becomes a different creation. Thank you, thank you, Ruth. Uh, I have to say she is an engaging voice in, in, in uh, your book, and uh, I would love to hear you read some of her poems. I, I've, I've read the book, but I want to hear them. They are, uh, they are a distinctive voice, and I'd, I'd love to hear you read them. So uh, why don't you launch into your reading, please? I'll do that, Neil, thanks. So uh, just before I do that, I wanted to give people uh, a sense of the, of the overall book. So this is the cover, which is already pictured on the poster. I might be, yeah, there, there you've got it, Neil. And um, uh, it is, it's a book that's structured in six parts. Um, and the, the parts are, I'll just uh, read them out now and then I'll, I'll reiterate. So it's beginnings, initiation, the lump, afterbirth, the dark time, and renewal. And then there's a coda. So um, I'm going to read from the first two sections of the book, beginnings and initiations, right now. Um, and before I do that, I wanted to um, uh, describe one of the great joys of writing this book, and that was the opportunity to visit the Jewish Heritage Center and to study the archival photographic um, repository and collections of North End Life. And um, one of the things that I did in this book, because I'm playing with so many levels, imaginative levels in terms of fiction um, and photographs, is I try using some of the images that are available to look at um, and held at the uh, Jewish Heritage Center. And so included in my book are 16 images, the vast majority of which are taken from the Jewish Heritage Center. And as I read, you'll see some of the images that um, I've used in the book, not all of them, just some of them. And so um, it's a way to kind of uh, even give greater veracity or to ground the poems um, in the remarkable uh, photographs that I've claimed for myself. You know, I've just taken them and used them at will. So as I mentioned, the first section is called Beginnings and I'll read some poems from that. Give you a sense of the trajectory. Fatso, cow, the kids call me. Cracked too, but I know better. My body sparkles, my mind stirs. Let them jeer, I say nuts to them. Uncle Nate brought us over from Russia and daddy says it wasn't easy. He wrote letters, filed forms, paid bribes, but that doesn't give him the right to lord it over us. When uncle barges into the house, mama scurries about, resents the charitable big shot for being so high and mighty. Daddy gets quiet, is kinder to his rich uncle, more willing to accept the big boaster. I try to behave, show respect, but secretly I slam my snaky uncle, Nate. When she's rushed out of the house, writhing in pain, I shout, Mama, Mama, into the scuffle, but no one hears. Suddenly, there's silence, and I hide under the bed. At dawn, Daddy returns to gently draw me out into the light of morning and the depth of grief. Ravenous and newly renounced by Uncle Nate. You freakish pair don't deserve my help. I visit Yunkel and accept the butcher's bargain. He gets what he's begged for in secret. Daddy and I get meat for soup to last the week. And now I'm going to move into the second part of this book, which is called Initiation. Some of you might know that Hada is in fact um, a uh, local sex worker 
who uh, works out of the North End community where she was uh, raised. Uh, and uh, this section of the poem describes just that, her initiation into sex work. She's also a very large uh, woman, a uh, young woman grows into even a larger adult woman. And that's part of um, a, a facet of her life that I explore in these poems. The first time I wrap my legs around Morgan tightly, then tighter, he cries, I love you, I love you, I love you. Words I need to hear to do it again with my Morgo, my dear Morgo. If you notice, Morgan is pictured right here in front of the Merchant's Hotel. Uh, my idea of Morgan, that's, that's who I've pictured there. It starts innocently, without purpose or plan. Visiting boys come to share a good time, safe in this place of ease. We give ourselves to big, deep belly laughter of pain subsiding in waves of raucous joy. Soon I learn hard truths. Never expect love and never give it away for free. They will climb atop, explore the folds of my body, plunge cocooning flesh they want. They want freedom they can afford. And if you look in the other, the second image, you'll see some guys lurking, lurking, waiting for the opportunity to visit Hoda. And Hoda, in fact, works out of a room in her house. This house with splintered stairs, sloping porch and cardboard walls makes refuge for the loneliness, loneliest of boys. Benji and Ralphie, Gordy and Jaime, who seek solace in swaddling arms as they moan in pleasure and sorrow a dirge for their small lives and mine. And then the last poem I'm going to read from this section before our first break. Lewd, you say? Yeah, I'm lewd. Crude and coarse too. I make my way with my body. What else would I be? A polite little Sue refined and ladylike? No way, no damn way. So those, those are poems from the first two sections of the collection. Uh, Ruth, thanks very much. Uh, I, I love hearing you read them because um, I can hear in the voice, she's a complex character, Hoda. There's, there is anger, there is passion, there is joy, there is strength, uh, there is grief. Uh, and I, I wonder if you could talk just a little bit about her complexity. How did you, did you imagine her as a complex character, a conflicted character? Uh, yeah, very conflicted. Um, and, and that's part of what I wanted to get at is the rich inner life that is kind of uh, irreconcilable and re like, all of the conflicting emotions that she feels do not come to together in any kind of reconcilable way. Um, and that's one of the things that um, uh, I really wanted to do is um, so much of Huda's experience is told on the surface um, in the novel. And uh, the opportunity to really get inside her head and to imagine the profound pain that she experiences. She loses her mother when she's very young. Uh, her uncle who sponsors um, the family to come from Russia abandons them. And then when her mother who is the cleaning lady uh, for the town, for the, for the community dies, uh, her uncle comes and wants to separate them and she is desperate to keep her uh, and her father together. And so she falls into sex work. Um, and the way in which she falls into sex work is something she, she doesn't really understand. She's little, she's maybe 11 or 12 when this happens. And so in a way she's, um, she's traumatized, but um, to some extent unaware of the degree of trauma that she suffers. 
And that's really what launches her into life, right? And she somehow manages to keep going forward. Uh, later on, comes to an understanding of the degree of suffering that she has endured and, um, and with an adult perspective is able to deal with it. But from the beginning, I really wanted to inhabit that complex state of messy emotion that calls Hoda to move forward, but not to figure out what's really going on and to just keep moving. Um, and also her, the way she lives in her physical body is something I really wanted to explore because um, she likes having sex. She likes the boys. And um, that's a part of her experience that I really wanted to look at. It's also a source of tremendous pain, which is also something that I wanted to look at. So yeah, um, the complex, uh, messy emotions that she feels is really what drove me. Thank you, Ruth. I, you know, I think that uh, everything that you just described comes through. I mean, uh, in fact, what, what happened to me as I was reading the poems was I wanted to return to Crackpot and think more about that character after hearing her in your poems. And the other thing I, I would say is she's looking for connection. She seeks connection uh, and she finds it in the only way that she can. Uh, so very interesting, very interesting incarnation, if you like, of, of her voice. I wonder if you'd like to read some more from the, uh, from the next section, Ruth. Sure. So th the next three sections. Um, uh, so the next section is called the lump. And um, uh, I'll tell you more about that after I read this, this, this selection of poems. At Yunkel's butcher shop, Mrs. Morosnik snorts, you're as fat as a cow hudda. I'd rather be fat than foul fishwife. But when my stomach rumbles and aches, I worry I'm like mama nursing a lump in my belly. And we move forward a bit in time. And then a knife cuts through me again and again, pierces with such force, I burst. What's happening, mama? What terrible thing did I do? And stops, suddenly I'm torn, gasp for breath. I hear a rustling in the bed sheets. What moved, what is it? Leap off the bed to look, but I'm weighed down by what? Bound by a thick, wet cord, I pull, pull again. And when it squats, squawks the lump, now a baby, now a boy, I see birth in darkest night. I survey the scene, mattress soaking, lump squirming, heed the voice that urges. Think later, act now. While daddy sleeps, I heave the mattress into the shed, wash the lump, count, it, count its fingers, toes, wrap it in clean sheets, stuff more sheets between my legs. Rush into the night, deposit the bundle on orphanage steps, hide, and when the door opens, flee. So I'm now moving into the next section, which is called afterbirth. So clearly Huda has given birth to a baby um, and she is unaware that she is pregnant. She just thinks that she's getting larger and she has uh, given birth to the child on her own and um, then uh, decides to act. She leaves the child at the Jewish orphanage and then returns to her home. 
Um, boys baffled by my testiness grumble. Hud is not feeling so hot. It's my time of the month, an easy answer to keep them away. Can't le let them near me, steer clear. Can't bear contact, don't touch the goods. Won't heed their pleas, forget it, hands off. And then um, after she's recovered, she regains the remarkable resilience that um, I so admire in her character. In the waiting room at Mount Carmel Clinic, I test for VD. I turn kibitzer, worried about the clap, are you? Maybe a little bit pregnant? My line of work, oh, I make ends meet. The press of memory eased by banter. So, uh, Ruth, there is a there is a question uh, about the, the first section that's just appeared. I wonder if you'd like to address this. Here it is. Uh, these somebody somebody writes. These days, we're supposed to help children develop self esteem. Hoda has illusions about herself due to inflated self esteem. Is this helpful or harmful to 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 her? Do you think? She has. Can you just say that last part? She has an inflated sense of self. Esteem. Yeah, she. Yeah, she has illusions about herself due to inflated self-esteem. Is this helpful or harmful to her? Um, well, I don't know if I agree that she has an inflated sense of uh, inflated self-esteem. And in fact, I think she just. Um, I think she believes that she's deserving of a place in the world just like anybody else is what I think and um, and so she kind of moves ahead with that sense of uh, uh, of deservedness um, that she is um, uh, a worthy person just like anybody else and that's what drives her and I think that is something that serves her very well in the present but that, of course, it comes back to bite her because she hasn't processed everything that she goes through until much later. So um, uh, on the surface, she might be seen as confident. But one of the things that I really uh, noted in the novel and I try to, I think, um, develop in my poems is the sense of vulnerability and fragility that is there all the time, I think, and underwrites that that drive. You know, she's so much in the world and so public and so uh, uh, voluble. She doesn't stop talking. She likes to kibitz. She likes to joke. But underneath it is a really uh, a suffering young person. And uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so I think that's important to attend to. I, I have to say, uh, Ruth, reading the, reading the the poems, the section having to do with with the birth of her of her child and her giving it up for adoption, for me was the most painful section to to read. It was it was quite agonizing. I thought, you know, this, this young girl who who almost doesn't really understand what's happening to her, and I thought that you captured that extraordinarily well. I wonder, was it difficult to write that section? Um, you know, the, that's a good question. Um, it was all very emotional to write, but it was also, um, I felt really good about giving Hoda the voice, uh, writing in her voice about these experiences. So to me, it felt like a bit, like, I felt like I was redeeming her in a way, not that she needed redemption. I'm not at all. I loved Wiseman's novel and treatment of it. If it not for her, that there be, there, there would not be this book. But I did feel that I was doing something for Hoda. So as difficult as it was, I felt good about that. Yeah, I did. Yeah. And um, thank you. Thank you. Um, would you would you like to move on to the next sure. section? So the next yeah. section Great. is called, nice. not surprisingly, the dark time. 
because of course, um, nobody I think could ever go through what Huda goes through without um, uh, suffering. And this is uh, the part that describes the aftermath. Behind the stalls of the public market, the young teamsters up early, unloading wagons take time to unload with me. When Grozny's wife goes wild with rage, Huda, you husband eater, Delilah, whore, threatens to expose me to daddy, I go crazy too. Who are you calling names? Chase her down Selkirk Street out of earshot. But her fierceness rouses me. What if he already knows? Then his trust can't be true and his silence is scarred shame. Dreams of screaming, screaming into the night, running wildly through the streets, of retracing my steps, moving backward in fear and panic, erasing the trespass of time, of shielding my son, a guardian spirit clutching his hand, feeding him sweets. And what should I do? Close up shop? Cross my legs and look virtuous? Who would soothe daddy's throat with ginger tea and honey, picnic with him in the park, follow his stories of restless human impulse? So there's two more sections that I was going to read from. Um, should I continue on, Neil, if there are no more questions to, at this point? You're, you're muted. There. Yeah, sure. If you would read those those sections, and then um, we can we can open it up to questions at the end. That'd That's be great. Thanks. Okay. okay, terrific. So now I move into um, the final section of the poem, which is called renewal. And this is where um, some of that realization happens that I refer to, and Huda. Um, uh, is redeemed in a way um, because she's brought back into the community and she's also granted uh, or acquires insight. For so long, I don't clue in. Mr. Manuk pinching my backside, tossing me coins as I scrub his floor. Yunkle throwing me bones and scraps after I rub him behind the deli counter. But now, with business in full swing, I finally say, see, they made me who I am, little orphan girl turned north end whore. And Huda um, uh, gives up uh, sex work after a while, and she becomes a hostess of a kibbutz Sarnia, and people come to love her presence because she's just so lively and vibrant. And she gives up sex work um, for um, uh, being kind of the main attraction of the kibbutz Sarnia. By war's end, my mattress flattened, tossed. I've turned regular showbiz gal, now hostess of Benji Badner's delicatessen in kibbutz Sarnia where nightly, with bells on in sequence, I shake up a party or two, boom laughter over pinochle, whist, corned beef on rye. Laser, my Galician, finds his way from Ukraine to Benji's, hangs around every night, waits to walk me home. He likes my company, longs to talk, hear me tell of North End life. That's it, just chit chat, more chit chat through hushed streets. How is it that's all he wants? He survived mass shootings, escaped the ovens, arrived here from a DP camp. All I need now, he says, is your straight talk. 
So um, for those of you who've not read the book, what you'll notice, um, what you'll know is that I have um, adapted much um, in this novel. So I have brought in new characters, I've brought in names, uh, I have pretended in terms of images that these are characters in the book. And um, I also imagine Hoda as a real life character. And uh, the, poem, the, the poem closes with a section that I've called Coda. And um, it is actually um, an homage to Hoda's body written in her own voice and I claim that it was found among her private papers. So this is the last poem that you'll read in the, in the collection. I bless this aging body for it is sound. I curse this aging body for it is weak. I embrace its persistence, abhor its flaps and folds, rely on its strength and deny its force. One day I waken to its will and can the body is guide, the body is guile, the body is grace, the body is mine. I love the idea of Huda, of Huda leaving behind her own papers. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, Dan Stone has a question for you. Dan, if you unmute your, yourself, you could ask the question directly. <clears throat> okay. Hi, thank you very much, Ruth. I was wondering whether you had written any poems in uh, in the father's voice, in well, in Daniel's voice. No, this was all this was all in Huda's voice, all in Huda's voice. Um, Danila is such a complex character. You know, there's debate about whether or not he really knew what was going on in the room next door when Huda was bringing all of the boys in, uh, and uh, because Danila is blind for those of you who may not know the novel. Denela is blind, which accounts for the reason why he's unable to go out to work and support um, him and his daughter after his wife dies. Um, so no, I, I did not write in Danela's voice. For me, it was Huda as this vulnerable girl, as this girl who makes her way in the world without, uh, and also the, uh, the connection that she feels to her father uh, is something that was so sustaining for her. I, I do, in some of the poems, I, I do talk about um, the relationship between her and her father, because one of the things that he gives her is this wonderful uh, inheritance of story. He loves her to death and he, um, he gives this kind of mythic story about how she's born and brought into the world and how it's a great miracle. And she does believe that um, to an extent, although um, uh, life experiences, I, of course, uh, bring that down to um, uh, bring her to reality. But um, no, the, the focus for me between her and her father is how she perceives him and what he's given to her as a, a, a not, I've not written in his voice. He's a very intriguing character, as, as of course she is. How do, does his basket business ever really take off, other than <laughs> through her sales salespersonship? I, I have this one poem about the baskets that I sh I didn't read, but I can read it um, because um, one of the things that Rachel, his wife, does before she she's dying and she knows that she's dying. And she gets, um, she brings her her husband. This is in the novel. She brings her husband to the, um, to uh, I guess it's the the Jewish uh, old folks home where he he is taught how to make baskets as a way to earn some money. Um, uh, and she's trying to help him acquire a practical life skills um, that he can draw on after she dies. And then Hada. Um, uh, forces all of her customers to to buy a basket after uh, after they're done, and um, so uh, this is partly what um, this poem is about. So those who enjoy Huda's home hospitality, hand job ten minutes, blow job ten minutes, 
body rub and tug 15 minutes, solo shag 15 minutes, group shag maximum three boys, 10 minutes each, 30 minutes. Must also purchase Danila's divine baskets, bread basket, knitting basket, clothespin basket, laundry basket, shopping basket. So he's busy making baskets and they overflow the house and she's unloading them on all of her clients, forcing them to purchase them as well. So uh, they, were, they are a unit. They are a unit right to the end. And in fact, um, the relationship that she uh, closes with, you know, she's, she in fact is engaged to laser at the end of the, uh, at the end of her story. And it's one that Danila sanctions and is so grateful for. And, uh, and Laser is, a, is himself a survivor. So the, um, uh, the union of the old and the new world is also something that is um, uh, uh, affirmed at the end. I wonder if, if uh, Adele Wiseman ever really knew anything about basket making. It's extraordinarily difficult. <laughs> he makes it look easy, but do I'll you get make off. Do you make baskets? Um, my, my wife's taken a couple of basket making courses. It's extraordinarily difficult. Yeah. Anyway, I'll get off. Uh, there are other questions waiting. Thank you very much. So Ruth, there are two, thanks Dan. There are two questions uh, for you. The first one is a, a question of definitions. Two of the audience want you to explain what kibitzarnia means. Can you oh. just briefly explain what a kibitzarnia is? It's kind of the it, it's it's the word that Wiseman herself uses, but I think of it as a deli. You know, it's a deli. It's where uh, where um, uh, to kibitz means to make fun, uh, and that's the word where that um, Wiseman uses for this deli that she is a hostess for. Yeah, so um, I think that's a particular use of the word, and I think it speaks to the to Hoda's character in the place, because she's hostess extraordinaire um, and kibitzer extraordinaire. Great, so here's a question from, from Noam Gonick to everybody. He says this, I suspect Wiseman's depiction of an underage sex trade worker would likely cause more outrage if it were published today. Does teaching crackpot present any difficulties today? Yeah, that's a terrific question. Um, well, in fact, uh, Wiseman published two novels. Uh, she published The Sacrifice in 1956, and it's a very traditional novel. It's a, it has a, a male um, at the center of the novel, um, and there's a murder of actually a woman who is, um, could be seen as a loose woman, uh, and, uh, and he is charged with her murder but the end of that novel redeems him. And so it's very much a traditional novel with this kind of male centered focus. And it was incredibly successful in its day. Crackpot, which was published in 1974, was not, um, it, was, it was very, very hard for Wiseman to get, it pub, to get the book published because of its subject matter. Uh, there is the matter of incest because her son actually, yes, her son actually becomes her client unknowingly um, when he becomes of age. And she realizes that it is her son. And rather than reject him because she has rejected him once by abandoning him uh, at the orphanage, she chooses to continue to have a relationship with him. And so um, the way I'm describing it does not point to the extraordinary moral undertone of the novel, but it is an incredibly and deeply moral novel. But in its day, it was really difficult for readers to accept. Um, in contrast, Crackpot endures in a way that the sacrifice does not. When I teach Crackpot, my students go they love the novel. They respond to it uh, in such profound ways uh, that the sacrifice does not resonate with contemporary students. It does not resonate in the same way. 
So I think Wiseman was in fact ahead of her time when she was writing that novel. And that um, uh, there are so many ideas in that text that um, uh, make it so fresh. And the character of Huda is more, um, uh, it, the students can respond to her and her trials in a way that uh, they find, I think, the sacrifice just much more dated. So there's this ironic reversal where Crackpot endures in a way that the sacrifice does not. The sacrifice came out of a time where it, it's, it was close enough to the end of the Second World War and the affirmation of this very traditional worldview and the character of this, of this devout figure who somehow loses his bearings and commits murder, then the reinstatement of this kind of world order was, I think, comforting to readers in 1956, whereas Huda just blew readers' minds when she came out. The reverse is the case now. Um, uh, Ruth, I wonder, uh, after, after reading uh, Hoda, after reading Radiant Shards, I wonder to myself whether or not reading this book will drive more readers back to Crackpot. What do you think? Do you think that it will give Crackpot more life? I, I kind of do. I, I wonder what you think. I hope so. I mean, I, I hope that uh, these works talk to one another. I'm not the first person to try to uh, or to treat Huda. Rachel Wyatt wrote a play called Crackpot, and um, and that uh, play uh, was staged and actually published. And uh, it, uh, it you know it, it gives you a sense of of how powerful Huda's voice is. That it gave rise it gave rise to a play, and now this this book of poems. And uh, I mean I do. I do hope that it returns readers to the novel. I also hope that um, they are interested in this kind of cross fertilization. Um, I mean, there are many, many writers who reimagine life for, for fictional and not fic non fictional characters. One of the thing about one of the things about Huda is how she traverses so many categories because um, Wiseman gave her life in fiction but she was actually a real figure. Um, uh, Adele Wiseman in one interview talks about having been pointed out this woman on a street corner by a friend they were driving by and, and her friend said, her male friend said, do you know that woman? She's, she's you know, introduced many of us to sex in the community. And it was this spark that then gave rise to Crackpot. So there's the real, there's the fictional, and then there's the playwright who returns to her, and now I'm the poet who returns to her. So there is this wonderful uh, life that emerged from uh, Wiseman's novel. Yeah. Very good, thank you. I wonder if there are any, any other questions from the audience or from Dan or anybody else who wants to chime in or anything else that Ruth might want to add uh, in, in closing at all. Any other questions from the audience? I'm looking at the chat line, but I don't see any. I'm curious how many people know Wiseman's novel. I'm, I'd be curious if anybody uh, uh, is, is willing to, to respond to that in the chat, whether that's, that's what, what brought you to this. If, if I could comment on that, Ruth, it, it's, it's, uh, it's surprising to me. I'm one of those people who taught The Sacrifice uh, because I thought it was a very powerful novel, but I think you're right. The, the Sacrifice is dated and it is traditional. It is old fashioned as it were. I taught it about 20 years ago. The students liked it and so on and so forth. But, but Crackpot always struck me as a more daring, more courageous, more uh, a novel that reached out in, in different ways. And I was not surprised at the time that it came out that it was less popular than a sacrifice because it demands more. It really does demand more of its, of its, uh, of its readers. So I, I, I'm delighted to see this book of poems. I did not know about Rachel Wyatt's play. I'll, I'll look for that yeah. because Crackpot, I think, has a, a enduring life, you know, it does have an enduring life. And, and Adele Wiseman does too. 
So it, it's going to be interesting to see what develops from that. She was a remarkable... I see that there's, there's a comment here from uh, one reader says, I read both novels many, many years ago and liked Crackpot better. I'm now motivated to get and reread it. And Dan Stone says, I read Sacrifice years ago and it didn't speak to me. I started reading Crackpot because of you and I find it fascinating. I'm only halfway through now. That, that's so great. That's terrific. Yeah. No, I, I think it's, uh, I, I've been teaching it for years. I've been teaching it for years. And um, another irony about the novel is that it has been taken up um, as part of the North American um, Jewish literary canon. So um, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, Josh Lambert wrote a book um, about um, key Jewish uh, writers and he put together a chapter that uh, brings together Philip Roth and Adele Wiseman uh, and Wiseman's Crackpot Only. So, you know, there's a real interest in her work in this particular work. Um, uh, and I, I think it speaks to the, the vision that she had. Her character is a remarkable achievement um, for its day. And still, I think she's a remains a daring figure. She asks you to consider her uh, place in the world from so many different angles. And it is a moral uh, work and uh, one that um, is painful, but absolutely, um, uh, you know, it shows remarkable resilience in the character and uh, it's affirming as a result. Well put, well put. So uh, any other uh, closing observations from Ruth or from the audience at all? If, if, if there aren't, I would like to turn the program back over to, I think Dan, and then Dan is going to turn it over in his right. Dan, over to you. Yes, I will turn. I will turn it over and turn it off, but first I'll, I'll, I'll comment. Um, I was quite fascinated by the, the black wedding that you describe at the very beginning, that uh, appears at the, the beginning of Crackpot, that is the, uh, the, the wedding in the, in the cemetery to, to ward off an epidemic. And I happened to be reading Professor S. L. Jones's book on influenza in 1918, and I saw that there was one in Winnipeg in 1918, presided over by Rabbi Kahanovich and Rabbi Gruber, the two, uh, in a sense, rival chief rabbis of Winnipeg. There's some mysteries connected with it, but apparently, it, you know, it's a local story, and I assume she knew something about it. But uh, so my no move on that I'd like to thank Ruth and Neil for bringing this subject and bringing the subject to light in such a such an uh, such an unusual way almost in a novel way but it's actually a poet <clears throat> it's a poetic way <clears throat> rather than a novel way and uh, I think uh, many of us will be read will be moved to read reread or at least finish the book that uh, some of us have started but not not finished yet. I'd like to thank Stan Carboni, Val Janievsky, Andrew Morrison at the JHC for putting this program together and Greg Maduro for his technical assistance. Uh, JHC has a, a pro series of programs. I won't spend a lot of time on it, but on uh, March 2nd, we have a, a conversation between Bernie Bellin, uh, editor of the Jewish Post with longtime contributor Jerry Posner about the history and current issues at the Jewish Post and News. You know that a lot of newspapers have gone out of business uh, as a result of changes, but the Jewish Post seems to be doing well. And here's an opportunity to find out more about it. <clears throat> Check our website, uh, jhcwc.org for upcoming programs such as uh, discussion of women resistance fighters in the ghettos, April 7th, Jews and Chess in Winnipeg, April 29th, the Little Synagogue on the Prairies, May 30th, that's in, in Calgary, and I see the organizer of that in the program here. Thank you very much, Irena Karshenbaum, for making the long trip from Calgary to come see us today. 
please take a look at the J Jewish Heritage Center's YouTube channel uh, for past programs and vintage films that have simply that have recently been put on online thanks to grants from the uh, from the Canadian government. Uh, <clears throat> so with that, I'll bring this to an end. With many thanks to Neil and Ruth and everyone and the audience for for joining us. Thank you. So thank you very much and. Goodbye for now. Thank you all.